So, our uh, next presentation covers all the complex, maybe complex uh, um, tasks, uh, open source projects face that uh, are beyond pure code. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, Isabel uh, for the presentation. And please give a warm round of applause for her. Okay, good morning. Um, I'm going to continue in English because I know at least one person here doesn't, doesn't speak German well enough to follow the presentation. Um, if you don't speak English, sorry. So, so, this is going to be about open source and how it's not just about source. How am I going to tell you something about what open source is all about? I'm a software engineer at Elasticsearch. We do lots of open source. We've got Logstash, we've got Kibana, we've got Beats and Elasticsearch Core, of course, which are all Apache licensed. Apart from that, I happen to be director of the Apache Software Foundation. I'm co-founder of Apache Mahout. Would you raise your hand if you know the project? One, two, three. I want to talk to you why you know it after the presentation. Um, apart from that, I'm co-founder of Berlin Buzzwords. It's a conference on all things scalable um, and storage, which happens in Berlin. So if you need an excuse to make your employer pay for a trip in June, like sunny, nice, to Berlin, go to this conference. Okay. In order to wake you up, how many of you are running their own open source project? Around about a little more than half, okay. How many of you have ever contributed? Pretty nearly everyone, okay. Um, speaking of contributions, anyone who wrote about an open source project in their blogs, um, publications, press articles, whatever? Okay, good. Did you ever help other users getting started with open source? Come on, I want to see your hands. I, do, I don't do this meetup trick of handing out microphones and asking questions. Okay, nice, nearly everyone. Um, how many of you are using open source in your day job? Keep your hands up if you contribute to open source as part of your day job. Nearly half of everyone, kind of, sort of-ish. Okay. How many of you are using open source in their spare time? Yes, everyone, good. Okay, so why should all of you care about what open source is about apart from the technology behind it? Let me tell you a story. So I convinced my mom to use Ubuntu several years ago. You remember this user interface that they used very early on? and then switched to Unity, which looked completely different. So totally screwed up my mom. I would totally I'm would. <laughs> so I'm, she's not the only one? Awesome. Um, she's also a fan of Shotwell. So after missing a few upgrade cycles, we suddenly had to go from one version to the other, except database schema wasn't compatible anymore. I was really, really happy to have my husband to dig through these um, database entries and convert to the new schema jumping several versions. So it was one day lost, mommy's still happy. And I'm happy that I have my husband who can do that. So if you do use open source in your spare time, you definitely want to know how it works so that you can talk to the right people in order to fix your problems or that you can fix these problems yourself. If you're, uh, if you, I've seen quite a few of you who, you who are using open source as part of your day job. Essentially, this boils down to betting your business on an external dependency. What happens if this project stops receiving, oh, uh, yeah, stops receiving any security updates? What if you need a tiny little change to the project to make it work for you, but you don't have the time and skills to do that yourself? Can you motivate the project to do it, or can you motivate a consultant to do that for you? And what happens to this patch afterward? How does it get um, applied to upcoming new versions? So I would suggest that even if you are not building open source yourself, but only using it, you still want to understand how these projects work if you are betting your business on it so you know what's going on. Last but not least, I've seen a few of you have raised your hands um, when I asked whether you run an open source project. 
When you get started, coding probably is like the topmost thing you want to do and you want to focus on. There are a few things to keep in mind, even when you start out. Um, the first thing that you want to think about when starting an open source project, in my personal opinion, is to, idea, to think about what your goals are with doing that. Do you want to build a business around that software that breaks into an existing market by changing the economics? That decision, that goal might have an influence on your decision uh, with respect to licensing, for instance. Do you want to collaborate with others who've got the same need as yourself to fix the problems that you have and that others may have so that you don't have to do all the work? That may require a different community model, for instance. Or do you simply just want to build up your CV? Do you want to build up your reputation and skill set that also may decide how you run your project? So essentially, it boils down to how much control do you want to exercise personally versus how robust do you, should that project be. If you would want to build a company around that project, my personal take would be that you probably want to control um, the direction of that project. If that at some point is supposed to be your product, you don't want to give up that control. If, however, this is like... I want to build that thing, but I want to collaborate with others to build something that's bigger than what I could achieve, then you would want to think about how robust that project should be, how easy it should be for people to contribute, and how interesting it should be for people to contribute. Okay. Now, what, are, what factors do I think about that are not code? Let's go for the easy ones. These are just the legal ones. You want to think about copyright, patents, and you want to think about trademarking. Let's focus on copyright first because this is like kind of sort of trivial. Um, so this is inspired by a post that was published at GNU.org. Essentially what you want to decide first is, do I care about any and all of my downstream users, including those that use derivative versions of my software? In that case, you go for the uh, uh, copyleft open source license. If you do libraries, especially if there are other libraries around that do similar stuff, go for LGPL so that people decide to use your library. If you go for server software, there's a, pro a huge wealth of discussion around APGPL, but if you go for something like um, stuff that's going to be hosted somewhere anyways, where users typically won't run it on their, on their own, you want to at least uh, take a look at the HGPL was I said something for you. For everything else, go for GPL, and you're pretty much um, set to go. So here's the other uh, option. I, wanna, I only want to ensure that those users get the four freedoms that use my very own project. That's the ideal case for non-copyleft license. Uh, when do you have something like that? Well, if you build something that's tiny, teeny tiny-ish and you don't care about license enforcement anyway, go for non-copyleft to begin with because if you don't enforce it, then there's no real reason. If you have a library that pushes a standard forward that's near and dear to your heart but which isn't widespread yet, go for something like uh, non -copy, go for some non-copyleft license. And again, if you want to have a project that changes established economics, non-copyleft, especially like say Apache software license is um, well established among businesses. So if you want to drive some compet competitor out of the market, my personal choice would be non-copyleft, probably Apache licensed. Okay, so much for easy stuff. Software patents, eh, sorry, I'm not going down this dragon hole. Um, if you want to talk software patents, go out there, see a CFSC fee boost, they do great work um, countering software patents, ask them about what this is all about. Tra trademarking. Why should you care about trademarking? First of all, what makes a good non-infringement infringing project name? When you build your op first open source project, you don't want the company to go after you because you are infringing their trademark. Even worse, you don't want another open source project going after you for infr infringing their project name. Um, so here's a little anecdote. How many of you know the name Hadoop? 
Keep your hands up if you know the story behind it. Um, the story behind it is that the child of the project's founder had a little uh, stuffed toy elephant that was called Hadoop. Doug Cutting once coined the sentence that children are very good at coming up with non-infringing project names. So that's how Hadoop came into uh, existence. It's also how Natch, like the, um, if you go, go, if you're searching for an internet scale search engine, nowadays it's more like a crawler, like an internet crawler. So, yeah, go for, go, go and have a look at Natch. Natch used to be the first word that this project founder's child ever said. So if you have children, make a little note of all the words that they invent. Might be useful one day. Okay, now you've got a non-infringing great name. Why should you continue to care? Well, only if, if you uh, really take care of your trademark, it remains a trademark, or if you register it. So you have to decide if it's okay for people to sell copies of your software on eBay without mentioning where that software actually comes from, like without attribution. It's typically not a good thing. You also need to take decisions like, is it okay for a fish pedigree of company to use a logo similar as it is to use a logo that's similar to yours? Um, see one over there. That one was actually created. Okay, for you have to take decisions on whether you should register your trademark or not, and you will have to. Um, find and counter trademark infringing um, occurrences of your name and logo. What's pretty good for that is if you have like a Google alert for your project, it's good to have anyway because people are discussing your project, so it's great to have that feedback, what people are using it for. It's also great for people using your trademark for conferences that you are not involved with. It's great for you um, finding products that are using your trademark uh, without having contacted you first. Then you need to identify whether that usage is actually infringing. So if, it, if this is a product that's sufficiently similar to your project, so that there could be confuse, confusion, it could be infringing. And then you have to actively go out and find, fight that infringement. Um, from experience and the Apache Software Foundation, what's usually sufficient is to send a reasonably friendly um, email to the person or to the marketing department and tell them, like, this is our trademark policy, you're not following it, please fix it. Typically, this is sufficient if you do it often enough. So much for the easy legal stuff. It says, like, easy rules, all fine. We're going to go to the slightly messier topic of people aspects. Honestly, I don't believe in the um, lonely, brilliant hacker. I believe that's a, a lie. Every one of us who writes great software um, stands on the shoulders of, of giants, either reusing software others have built or reusing ideas of others or even better, collaborating with other people. Also, great software is refined over and over, so it's not like right ones. So I believe that a project without people is a dead project. And a project with a, with a single point of failure when it comes to contributors is pretty high risk. At, a, at Apache, we've got the saying of community over code. What's more important there's nothing more important than to have a vital community behind your um, open source project because this is what keeps it alive. So what I, do I mean with people and what do I mean with community? Part of those people that should be interesting to you are potential users of your project. Where do you find them? How do you turn them into actual users? And once com converted, how do you retain them? So there's a term for that. That's called marketing. Um, how do you do marketing? You go to social media, you tweet about it, you probably use your own hashtag, you use a separate Twitter handle for Apache Mahout. We have the at Apache Mahout Twitter handle, which retweets all interesting news that are related to Apache Mahout. You, um, you search for mentions of your project to find out what people are using it for, you get involved in these discussions to find out more. 
why should you do that? First of all, it's good feedback for your development, like what should, what are people re really interested in? On the other hand, you will come into the situation where people ask you, why should I use this project? What are other people doing with it? At, at uh, Apache Mahout, we used to have this um, wiki page, which was just powered by. It was an alph alphabetically sorted list of people who admitted to using Apache Mahout, and sometimes they were brave enough to tell us what they were doing with it. This was extremely helpful to answer the question of what, which people are using your project. What can I do with it? Look at this. this is a, those are the real world use cases. So there's also this one instance when I went to an ApacheCon in Amsterdam and heard one of Solar's, Apache Solar's users talk about what they did with the project. It's typically much more believable, much more um, approachable if your downstream users talk about what they do with your projects and you selling it. So if you can get some, some of that information on your project public, that's, that's super nice. At some point, you may want to decide if you want to run your own conference, if your project becomes really, really um, successful, or you may want to leverage some pre-existing one. So there's a couple things you can do without conferences. You can talk to the press. You can write press announcements and hand them out. Um, I've made very good experiences with talking to Heise people here in Germany. Um, people at Software and Support also usually are open to receiving news that they can publish on their site. It helps if these press announcements are generally understandable, not just for the hardcore geeks of your project. What you can do as well is that over time, um, news magazines will come to you asking for guest articles. So you can start writing them yourself. You can start reviewing books if you have the time in order to know what other people are writing about your project. If you really have lots of time left, you can write your own books, or you can start writing your documentation such that it can be published as a book as well. So speaking of writing books and supporting users, some of your downstream users will be happy reading just through the docs. Many of them won't. Quite a few will prefer going to conferences like FrostCon here, being told what's new, being told what's interesting. So you will end up giving talks at conferences. More important than that, you will probably end up talking to people in the hallway. Um, what I found in, um, helpful is to have your presentation at the beginning of a day or at the beginning of the conference even, because that means that people will come to you and ask you questions on your project, because it's easier to rem remember me standing here than me remembering everyone in the audience. Sorry, I'm pretty good with faces, but not good enough to remember anyone, everyone. You may end up standing in, at a booth, answering questions, so just being available. Um, here at FrostCon, you should, of course, check out the Elasticsearch booth outside. We've got Philip with us, who's happy to answer any questions and happy to um, channel all of your rants to the um, project and company internally. There's another booth by the Apache Software Foundation that you check, should check out. They've got nice stickers, and they can answer all the questions about Apache. Of course, you should also check out the Free Software Foundation booth. This is, these are just like my three main favorites, and there is many more outside. Okay, over time you will have to do some kind of support. What does support look like? You will have people just beginning in your project, and you want to mentor them, and you want to support them, not just scare them away. There will be questions that come in over and over again, and you will have answered them already. Instead of telling them, go to the uh, frequently asked questions page, makes this um, frequently asked questions page linkable and links them to the correct question. It's pretty helpful and for anyone searching for the same answer, they will find the correct and um, detailed answer without you having to type that up every day. Um, one, one hint about that is that if your first time users and beginners are happy, they might one day turn into successful contributors. Are there any students in this room? 
or people dealing with students, are you aware of the Google Summer of Code internships? One, two, three. So essentially, it's a way of getting you paid to contribute to open source. Not, not always quite as well paid as working for an IT company in, say, Germany, but it gives you the ability to contribute to your favorite project and get money in returns. So to, in, in my opinion, this is quite a nice deal. It's only for coders, yes, it's only for coders, unfortunately. One hint concerning beginners and concerning giving support. People may not use the communication channels that you prefer. Um, at Apache, we've got the saying, what didn't happen on the mailing list didn't happen at all, but there are people who prefer having their questions uh, posted and answered on Stack Overflow. So it does pay to spend some time there and fetch users from where they are, especially if your goal is to grow your community. Speaking of mailing lists, um, when you create your project, helping out isn't just about providing code samples, it's also about answering questions. So what we did at, at Apache Mahout is to give out like the commit bit, like the uh, okay to um, commit to sub subversion, back then, now it's good, um, just for people answering questions and just for people helping others grok the project because machine learning isn't quite that easy. So we've had a, uh, a couple people who were into the field and who knew a lot, lot of use cases but didn't have the time to contribute code-wise, but they made great contributions on the mailing list, answering questions, giving architectural advice, etc. So at some point, you, as if you have a project of your own, you want to reward that. Speaking of mailing lists, how many of you speak one more language than just English. Pretty much everyone. So there are projects who do a great job at um, provide, providing localized resources, be it mailing lists for people who are uh, uncomfortable communicating in English or whatever the project's native mail, uh, language is. There are also projects doing a great job at translating documentation. Just one example, there's the Apache HTTPD. They've got great documentation, and not just in English, but also in German and other languages. So despite the fact that probably nobody insta installs the um, web server by going to the download button on the Apache website, people still come back to the Apache website for the documentation, which I think is a great thing, if, especially if you look at some of the major um, big data projects their documentation usually is lagging behind quite substantially. Okay, there may be users who are not fond of using mailing lists. There exist communication fora, uh, in this case discussed at Elasticsearch, which provide good access both for people who are uncomfortable with using stuff like mailing lists and who would rather prefer to have a discoverable um, interface, user interface, which also provide a side channel that gets um, mirrored to a mailing list so that people can interact either way they want. Honestly, I'm a mailing list person, but at least for Elasticsearch, this thing is configured well enough so that I can deal with just using the browser front, front end. I wasn't convinced to begin with at all. Right now, I'm a convert. Okay, now you've got potential, now you've got users and you've got potential contributors to your project. How do you turn them into contributors? One thing that I found helps is prioritization. Like one of the most common questions we got at Apache Mahout was, I want to contribute. What can I do? We are like, me, go to the Jira issue tracker and look for something that looks like it fits your need. What's actually usually slightly more effective is to use the project yourself and fix something and scratch your own itch kind of ish, like fix something that bugs you hard enough. Um, the second most common question you get is, when will you implement and ship feature X? What's the common answer for that? Common answer is, patches welcome. Sounds pretty... Um, Deflective, pretty defensive, go away, I don't want that patch. 
what it truly means in the projects that I've been involved with is, I'm sorry, I don't have the time. Please help me. So it's really an invitation to help the project out. And this is also how the project should be using it. Why shouldn't you use it as a defensive strategy? If your user actually sits down writing this patch and from the very beginning you had no intention of uh, merging it or uh, using it, then this will turn in a, into a huge mess and into a huge mass of um, frustration because there's a user who put lots of time in it, probably um, spent a lot of time cleaning it up. So better tell them up front if you want that. If you really want that, you're free to fork the project, go ahead. But we, this is not the direction that we want to go to. Now about inviting contributions. What I've learned the hard way at Apache Mahout is that you should be explicit about which kind of contributions you want. So this is what, Apache Mahout is about machine learning, so what people thought we were after was just implementations of new machine learning algorithms. After a couple of years, this was like the least wanted patch ever. What we wanted was cleanup, was more testing, was more documentation, was help on the mailing list, was help with uh, public relations, was help with um, helping other users, etc. Was help with scaling, was help with benchmarking. So at some point, I sat down writing a uh, call to action, my heart needs your help email, listing everything that was not writing a new algorithm. So it helps to be very explicit about um, what you want. It also helps to write down how a contribution actually works, like step by step. This is how you check out, this is how you communicate, this is how you build, these are the tools you need for building, and this is how you contribute your patch. I know several senior uh, level software engineers who have no clue how to read a diff. They're great engineers, they could do great architectural work, they could do great coding, they still don't know how to read a diff or how to read a patch. So if you want these people, um, and if you want to get them in, teach them and train them. What helps, of course, as well is to have like a, an up-to-date issue tracker. So have real-time help, re help requests there, to track feature discussions there, and to make it visible to others which problems are being currently worked on, or which have been decided as not being uh, on the roadmap right now. A little anecdote to that. We ran a local Hadoop hackathon in Berlin um, as a side hackathon to Berlin buzzwords. So we had many, many non-Hadoop coders here, but we also had a few core Hadoop coders. So we ran like a little poll. What do you want to do? Some people wanted to work on feature X. Some people wanted to do um, use case Y. What was by far the task that was most voted for was to get a walkthrough how checking the project out building it, making a change, and contributing to the project looks like, and maybe getting a glimpse of what the other side of the fence looks like. Like, what does the developer on the other end do to your patch? So what helped for this hackathon was that the Hadoop project had had a few issues in their task trackers that were really trivial. Like, look, here's a typo in our documentation. Go fix it. Here's a little typo in our vari var variable name. Go fix it. So people had something, some tiny change that probably didn't break anything, and they could just walk through that process to get um, familiar with it. It's like if you're living in this open source world, this feels really, really natural. If you're living in a corporate world where oftentimes code reviews aren't even um, common practice, this can feel very, very scary even to a senior person. So having these tiny issues that can get people started is very helpful. What else? What do you do if you have someone who submitted their first patch? Here's your patch. Clock's ticking. You want to give feedback fee early. You want to automate as much as you can to avoid um, work on your site and decrease the time to first response. 
Um, Hadoop does a good job with that. They've got like a patch checker that checks if all the tests have been submitted, if everything is correct style-wise, so no, but no human being has to look at that. You also want clear rules for what constitutes an acceptable patch. So if you say no, it's clear why. It's not a person's issue. Um, of course, people spending lots of time to work a patch only to have it rejected don't make happy contributors. So don't go through these endless cycles. When you do this review, rem remember that people may do this on their corporate time. So context switching takes time. Projects move on. If it takes a couple months to get this patch in, you may no longer get the feedback that you need. So you, if, you, if this is an interesting patch, get the feedback and changes early on. Otherwise, you may have to, need, have to do them yourselves. How can you motivate as well? You can ship, ship chocolate. I once was offered iTunes coupons uh, for doing a patch. I didn't accept the iTunes coupons. What was more important to me um, was to get this person blog about a patch out. I was essentially writing this blog post as a guest blog post, getting more reach. What I got, was, get, got as well for my first contribution was lots of thank yous. I got it in the JIRA issue, so that I didn't have to open myself. I got it in the um, commit message plus in the release notes. It's just a tiny little name mention. But if you Google for my name plus a project, you still find it today. And it was very helpful to have this name mentioned there in order to justify to my employer why I was doing that. Because suddenly this employer could go out bragging about how one of their um, employees is actually into open source, which for them being a consulting company was a big thing. You can say thank you, like saying thank you only gets you so far. Um, at some point, if people invest too much, um, you may want to think about getting some financed, getting some funded. So how do you get, how do you find payment? There's foundations that, whose whole purpose is to funnel purpose, um, money from sponsors to developers. CSVC funding for some projects. Um, for some other projects, you can find um, freelance gigs for your collaborators. Was that a little warning? Open source pro um, project owners and contributors usually wear multiple hats. In my case, multiple jackets. Today I'm wearing the Elasticsearch jacket, but I'm also talking about my experiences at CASF, my experiences in the wider open source ecosystem. So always be aware of what hat is on your head. Okay, speaking of funding, what do you need funding for? You need funding for the machines to host your infrastructures, like issue trackers, source control. You can use CAN hosting versus self-hosted. Currently, it's pretty common to use GitHub. Remember that if your project is long living, GitHub may not be the coolest kit in 10 years time. Source Forge, Forge once was and is no longer. So you may think about how easy it is to move all your assets out of that CAN hosting. Um, you need time to configure this infrastructure. Even if you use GitHub or even if you use an issue trackers that's hosted, you still want to configure it to meet your needs. You probably need machines to actually work on yourself sitting in front of you, like your laptop. And you need to do, need time to do this coding work and you need time to do the non-coding work. So that's why you need funding. And most likely there's different sponsors for different points on that list. Speaking of funding, you can, of course, fund the ASF. That's how. If you need help, talk to me after, my, after this talk, and I can get you on that list. OK, another thing, communication. You want to communicate your vision very clearly. So you can tell people what's going on, so you, that you can keep people out, out and stop them from spending time if what you do is actually not what they need. And you can embrace people and pull them in if this is what, it's what they really need. Also tell them what your priorities are to avoid discussion about a patch, because what is better depends on your um, definition of quality. Um, if, you look, if you work in a tiny team, one-on-one -on -one communication is great. If a team grows, this turns into mass media and doesn't scale anymore, so you want a central up. So what kind of communication channels can you have? 
you can have meetings in person. It's a really high bandwidth. You can talk to each other, you can see each other, you can communicate, you can talk back and forth. But they're expensive to set up. They are synchronous both in time and space, so you have to ship people to one location. They are also not durable because they have to be repeated for every new human in the project. Let's go a step back. We do a video chat. It's still pretty high behind us. We see the faces and they're all a little less body language. It's still kind of pretty expensive to set up because they are still synchronous in time. Imagine having one person in Australia, one person in the US. It's going to be really, really tricky. So it needs good technology. Um, you need a good internet connection. You need a good um, computer. If you've got someone where internet connection is bad, this is probably not an option. Also, it's barely durable. Imagine having to watch all the video chats again when you join the project. You're not going to do that. You can go for an online group chat. IRC is popular. There's hip chats, there's Slack, whatever. It's lower bandwidth. So it's still uh, it's text only. There's little cues like your partner's typing right now. It's rather cheap to set up, but it's still synchronous in time. And it needs a decent client. It's rather durable because you can search the logs, but it's, trust me, it's hard to follow in retrospect. There's web fora, low bandwidth, text only, cheap to set up. It's as, suddenly it's asynchronous. So somebody can post a question, somebody can post the answer once they are online, and there's no need for them, them to um, coordinate. It's pretty durable. You can search these discussions. You can follow archive discussions. That's pretty nice. Mailing list is similar, um, except now it's really text only. You can use your issue tracker. It's nice because it's low bandwidth, it's asynchronous, it's durable, it's well structured, but it's really, really fine grained. If you look at the bug tracker of Elasticsearch Core, you will have a hard time figuring out what the strategy is, except you know exactly how this bug tracker is being used by the um, project. So for higher, um, like higher level views, you can use wiki pages. They are well, sometimes structured. You can go for web pages, which, are, which hopefully are really well structured, which lead you through everything you want, which have documentations, which have the high level view. So what I want to tell you is use the right communication medium for the task at hand. Um, you will have to need all of them. You will have to use all of them. Like if you have a burning conflict where people are fighting each other, get them on a video chat to talk to, them, to, to each other. And probably sometimes it goes both and all is fine. Sometimes it's just like, okay, technology failed us, we misinterpret, uh, there was a mis misinterpretation of states. Um, like when I call my husband and O2 tells me that his line um, is busy, and it's not actually busy, but he's just clicking me away because he's in a meeting, so this is like, okay, we talked in an hour and we figure out O2 was a culprit, everything is fine. No need to um, communicate through the broken channel anymore. What you do want is one canonical place for keeping current status. Where do you go to figure out if a build failure is fixed already? Is that on the mailing list? Is that in the issue tracker? Is that somewhere else? Have it in one place. You want one canonical place for documentation. No separations there. You want one canonical place for tracking previous decisions. At Apache, this long-term memory is provided through uh, mailing lists mainly. It can be different at different projects, but have one place where people can go. If you pull more and more people in, you suddenly will think about mental health and you will think about overcommitment. One thing to avoid, avoid the lick cookie effect, jumping on every task. I'm going to do it five months later. It's still sitting there. So there's a couple dozen people who could have done it, but didn't do it because you jumped on it. Leave it there, leave it sitting, if you don't do it immediately. Maybe someone follows up. Avoid getting too much on your plate. At some point, you will need to tell people, my pipeline is full, patch is welcome, please help me out, um, ask for help. So there's a few um, nice pages, especially at Apache on... Um, remaining sane and not overcommitting. You will also have to think about physical health. Because if you're sitting at your laptop for hours and hours and hours, there's a good chance that your hands 
will be very angry with you. There's a good chance that your neck will be angry with you. I've got a better time carrying my 11 kilogram child all day than sitting in front of my laptop all day. Um, neck is worse when I'm sitting in front of my laptop all day because I like huddle together. Um, there's a great keynote at um, Berlin Buzzwords two years ago by Eric Evans on ergonomics and what he, um, pain he went through by not following this, ad this advice. If you don't believe my words, watch this keynote, probably you will believe him. You will also need to think about project growth. As soon as you have several projects, several people working on your project full time, for newcomers, it will feel like drinking from the fire hose because they are contributing eight hours a day to your project, multiple people. So you will need to find a way if you want to have a diverse community to enable those who don't have that time, who are probably doing it after work or just as a side project at work to follow up with what's going on. You will also need to uh, deal with poisonous people who try to destroy the culture of your project by trolling or by asking the same questions over and over and being very persistent. So you will need to figure out strategies to identify these people um, to, gather, um, to gather data about what's happening and how much energy is actually draining from your project and to kick them out. If worst comes to worst. There's a few talks, one by Ben Colin Sussman and one by Brian Fitzpatrick on dealing with poisonous people. There's a great YouTube recording on talks that Christian Kerntop gave at this very conference a, year, a few years ago on what he, how he dealt with flameworks and breaking communications. There's also a nice presentation on the Rust community online that talks about how publishing acceptable and unacceptable behavior together with the countermeasures that are going to be taken if you break this contract can help build a, a friendly community and can help keep people out that you no, do not want. Because one thing to keep in mind is no matter which rules you, rules you set up, even if you don't set up any rules, you will always, always exclude some people. And somehow some culture will evolve. My advice would be to build this culture um, consciously, to read strategies on how to build the cultures that you want to see. Some culture will evolve. It may not be the ones that you want. Finally, change management. What's the biggest change in an open source project? Leader leaves. Nobody's there anymore. Prepare your exit well in advance. Me personally, I did Berlin Buzzwords first time in 2010 with no intention of running this event more than once. Unfortunately, we had attendees who wanted to come back. So now I was left with a conference that depended on me doing all the marketing, all the outreach, all the sponsorship. Fortunately, not doing all the accounting. That's what I had a producer for. But I still had to do the ta uh, talk selection together with a few um, other open source contributors who helped me with this conference, one being Simon Wilner, the other one being Jan Lenard. But suddenly we had to find a way to make this conference stand on its own feet. Me personally, it took, for me personally, it took four years to get rid of this conference without breaking it. So build this handover in from the beginning, document from the very beginning, and delegate from the beginning, and find a way to build a memory into the project you do. So it's really mostly about delegation. And with that, it's time for me to wrap up and to start the discussion because I want your feedback and I want your um, questions. So if you have any questions, I have the microphone. Well, come on. So, um, what I'd like to, um, uh, to ask you is, um, especially in the, um, if you set up a, a project and uh, if you don't have the, the right communication culture, are there any hints you could give us to, to improve on that? If 
first one, so, so about uh, improving culture, is the first one lead by example. Be the, you should be the committers that you want to meet coming to the project. Well, the other ones, there are tools out there. One book by Peter Hintjens on building successful open source communities. Um, there's one on building successful online communities that you can read where there's actual tools like gamification tools, um, being transparent, etc., that help you do that. There's quite a bit of literature that can help you. One thing that I find helps is to lead by example. This helps very much. The other one is um, if there is like root behavior, to keep the discussion technical, but to call out people on their root behavior and then lead the discussion back to a technical topic. What also helps if you keep, um, like sometimes you read an email and you're really upset about it. What helps is to take a breath, walk away from the keyboard, come back and reply to this email in sort of like a professional context with keeping most of this anger out and keeping all of the ranting out. What you need for that is like a distance between, between you and um, the email you are just answering. Um, one hint for the first three questions, you, are, you should go to the Elasticsearch booth, there's, ra there's a surprise waiting for you. Uh, okay, I'm lucky then, I think. Um, I wanted to ask um, what did work for you best for event management from the infrastructure side? I, I've been what? organizing events myself and I've been struggling finding an open source solution to gather all the details for a conference, for example. Um, what do you mean with uh, infrastructure for accounting, for uh, managing speakers? Yeah, for managing speakers, websites. For so I, I haven't been... So I do have an event producer, I don't like the systems they are using. The one that I like from a speaker's perspective is the one that Frostcon is using and that is FRAP. Mm -hmm. um, you, there's also a talk, I think today, I don't know, ab about what tools Frostcon is using. So if you don't make it to this talk, check the schedules, there will be a recording of it and they will talk at like, great lengths. Right, I'm interested because I'm, I'm a mentor at Google Summer of Code and we are doing open event tool and we want to improve and maybe work also mm -hmm. on that. Thank you. Yes. Over there. Hello. Um, thank you very much for the inspiring talk. Um, I was just wondering, this is now a very long list of very big words and if in the beginning uh, you are just one coder with one idea, uh, where do you start? I mean, it's like um, I feel a little bit overwhelmed. Do you, take a, do, you, do you take a depth first approach where you say, okay, you know, I do the code and then I spread out or do you go breadth first before I code anything? I start building up it, all it, the departments? It, it depends uh, on your preference. So the way I started with Apache Mahout was that I tried to find, so, so my goal was to build something, not necessarily to build a business around, but to build something that would be bigger than me. So the first step I did was to find people that are like-minded, that want to do the same thing. What, I, what we together then did was to figure out if there's a project already there that covers our use case. Unfortunately, there wasn't. And the third thing then was, okay, we decide on a license, we decide on hosting, and then we go coding. And we'd never forget about getting new people in. So it really depends on your, on your goal. I think there was another question. Yes. Uh, first, thank you very much for the talk, very interesting. Uh, second, I was wondering if you know any studies, because you, you spoke about that it's very important to answer quickly uh, to a pull request, to, a, to contributions, otherwise they might get lost, and that makes a lot of sense. But I'm wondering if you know any numbering around how many contributions might be lost if you, you know, in, in open source projects. Sorry, no clear numbers. No clear numbers. Sorry? <laughs> no numbers here. Ah, okay. It's interesting. Oh, but it would be an internet, actually an, an interesting um, study to know. I mean, we, we work at the same company. You can go to Elasticsearch Core, ch check our GitHub issues and see how old they are. I'm actually thinking to do it. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> 
So we have one more giveaway because he's working for the same company, so same gimmicks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> one more question, come on. So it's like a Rubik's Cube, so there's power chargers, so I'm not talking about um, pens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here you are. Um, one thing I didn't hear you talk about uh, is w when one's thinking about coding, um, uh, one often tries to uh, make the number of uh, differences in, in approach to a project as small as possible from established practice. Um, it seems to me there are big advantages doing the same thing on the non-coding side, uh, especially, if, for example, you, you talked about walking people through the committing process. There'll be a lot of people who are familiar with committing to other open source projects, um, and presumably there's quite a lot of mileage in making your process uh, only different when it's really important to your project. Um, are, I suppose, uh, I, uh, that, uh, I, was, uh, I, I was wondering really whether uh, you have anything to say about uh, resources for, I suppose, turnkeying that in the same way as you can turnkey quite a lot of the technical side, the technical infrastructure for a project. Um, so the reason why Apache Mahout is Java is because at the time when we created this project, there was a huge amount of Java, Java developers. So we knew that there are uh, just a tiny fraction of people who know about machine learning and going for some exotic programming language would even further reduce the communities that we can draw from. So that's why we decided for Apache Mahout, uh, for, for Java. The reason to go for Maven slash Ant was because it was a well-known, well-established build system. So that people who get started know how to get started. Um, you may hate Maven as much as you, as you want. If you want to make it easy for Java devs to contribute, make your project follow the Maven structure so they know where the source code is lying, so they know instantly how to get stuff into the IDE without reading documentation. Any additional hurdle makes it even harder for people to get started. That's very, very true. So those are all uh, technical choices about the project. I, I was really wondering, the, the same thing, uh, maybe more with uh, processes, on the, on the non, I was, I was asking on the non-coding side, so making it as easy for people to apply their knowledge from other projects okay. on the non-coding side as it is on the coding side in the way you're talking about uh, using um, skills that are common, yeah. technical skills. Yeah, I, so for some of the topics I've been talking about, you don't see a lot of, um, commonalities between projects. I only have experience with the ISF and within the Elasticsearch, of course, so it may well be that similar processes exist within the Debian community, Fedora community, and what have you. I can't talk about that because this is apparently not my background. Um, what I found helpful when getting started with projects is to write down some of these processes. When I started at Apache, nothing was written down. No, that's not true. I didn't find the documentation, sorry. Try Googling for Apache and Ken Jenkins. What you find is the documentation on how to set up Jenkins behind an Apache. You don't find the Jenkins of the Apache Software Foundation. Not helpful. So you need some do good documentation on how things work. It does help to look across boundaries. If you are within the ASF, it does help to have some insight into other communities. What I realized from my own background is that this kind of um, looking behind the scenes is pretty time consuming. So I've got some insight into the Linux kernel community by virtue of having a husband who's into this community. I've got some insight into the FSFE just because they are also in Berlin and I know some of these people. This is how it works, but it's time consuming and there's, I know few people who have experience with community, like crossing boundaries and comparing things and how things work, but it's, that's definitely something that I would find interesting. Okay, then... No more gimmick. gimmicks doesn't mean no more questions, but you can talk to Indeed. me afterwards. <laughs> so you will be around uh, on your booth um, for the remaining of the day? Uh, I have a booth, children's room here. So I've got <laughs> okay. a little giggling with me and I've got my husband with me. If you see a little girl about, who's eight? 
was a pitchy patchy pinguin, I'm probably not far away. <laughs> All right. Then once again, thanks for your insights in uh, project management for open source project. Thank you very much.